Okay, now we're going to start with me. Okay. <laughs> Amen. So, it's an exciting thing to be in the house of God and to let the Word of God feed us. And I just, uh, I believe with all my heart that's exactly what's going to happen tonight. We're picking it up from where we left off. I believe Brother Drew was the last one, right? To, to share a little bit. Yes. Yes. I believe that's, that's true, right? All right, so we're going to pick up where, where he left off. We're going to be in chapter 10. And we're going to read verse 43 of chapter 9, which is the last verse. And then we're going to read on. And as we get into chapter 10, what we're going to find out is that that little verse in the end of chapter 9 is uh, it's significant. Okay? If there was a title, you know, when we go through the book of Acts, when we go through any book, we go chapter and verse. We go through it in its order so that we can get all that we're supposed to get out of it. Okay? We don't just hit it, hit and miss, and get those spots here and there. We, we, we want to get everything that's in it. And in doing that, thank you, brother. In doing that, um, you know, you get the, 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 the whole counsel of God, you get that fullness. Uh, I believe that that um, by doing that, sometimes there's not really a way to put a title, but I want to give a title to this portion of uh, the passage that we're going to be looking at. And it, it, I even have like two titles. Okay, So one of the titles uh, would be this, that God is tearing down our walls. God is tearing down our walls. Now, the other one would be probably more of a saying. We've heard this said many times that God is working on us and he's working in us so that he can work through us. How many of you have heard this before? I know you've heard it here because I say it a lot. God is working on us and working in us so that he can work through us. You put those two titles together, what you're going to find out is those are clues to how, what we're going to be talking about today as we bring out the, the, the scripture, as we bring out this early church and their experiences with God and with the church and what, what, what God was doing at, this, at that time and how it affects us today. I think we're going to hear some things that maybe you didn't even think about when you read those passages. Maybe you went ahead and read ahead to see if you can get some insight. And I know God gave that to you, but I believe God's going to give us even more. And so once again, God is working on us and working in us so that he can work through us. And the other clue is this. He is tearing down our walls. You got that? He is tearing down our walls. So, book of Acts chapter 10, we're going to read verse 43 of chapter 9 first and, and keep going. So it was that Peter stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion. Of what was called, or excuse me, of, of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he, had, when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Verse 8. So when he, when he had explained all the things to them, he sent them to Joshua. Verse 9. 
The next day, as they went on, excuse me, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. Verse 12. And it were, uh, to the in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Verse 17. Now while Peter was wondering within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you seek, whom you seek. For what reason have you come? Verse 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has, and has a good reputation among all the nation, the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to, uh, to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa, I come to him. We just read 24 verses, folks. Let me ask a quick question. How many of you were able to hear it and read along and sort of understand it like a story? How many of you, it was clear enough? Okay, because I'm a little tired tonight, so I'm reading a little slower. But at the same time, I want you to sort of hear it like a story. Okay, again, I only saw four hands go up. How many of you... You really did understand it as we were reading it. Okay, good morning. <laughs> it's so important, folks, that we get the Word of God. Not just our views and our opinions of what it says, but the Word itself. The Bible tells us clearly, blessed is the man who reads the words of this book. Amen? All right. So, we read 24 verses on purpose. I don't know if we're going to break down all of the verses. I don't, know, I don't think we're going to do that tonight. But if you and I will take the time to remember that we are following the journey of the early church, the, 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 the first church, and, and realize that the first church had so much to learn. There were so many things going on in their life. It was brand new. They didn't have the privilege you and I have to look back on the church and learn from their mistakes and learn from their good deeds and learn from their obedience. They didn't have that privilege. You and I do. We look on the scriptures and we can look at the example that was given and learn from it. Right? How many know good example is always a blessing? Right? Always a blessing. When you see someone who gives a good example, you learn something. You can even learn from bad examples as well. So, folks, when we look at this passage we're reading, we're looking at an early church, a young church, who, who uh, all the members have so much to learn. But I want to focus in on one individual uh, tonight. Then we will touch on some of the other people in the story. But tonight, if we can, we're going to sort of zero in on Peter. 
uh, all the way up until the, the nine chapters, we see that that Paul the apostle was 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 mentioned, and we looked at some of the things that happened with him and all of that, but. If you notice, there's a change in chapter 9 that brings us to start focusing on Peter. But if you look at it from God's point of view, it, the, the Lord is saying to us here, look at my early church. Look what I'm doing. I'm doing miracles. I'm raising up people. I'm saving people. You know, I'm rescuing people, adding to the church daily. People are being discipled and learning the ways of Christ. Okay? And folks, I want to I want to point out to you that everybody's learning. Just like everybody should be learning here. What do you mean by that, Pastor? This is what I mean. The person we're going to zero in on tonight is Peter. Who is Peter in the early church? He's an apostle. He's one of the leaders. He's one of those people that everybody in the early church looked up to. He is one of the twelve who walked with Jesus from the very beginning. So there's a great level of respect for Peter. Right? Okay, just a, a soft amen will help you know you're still awake. Amen. So... When we're looking at Peter, we're looking at one of the leaders of the church. If you think about the way Jesus treated the twelve, there were times when Jesus pulled aside Peter, James, and John separately from the twelve and took them further because he had plans for them to hold greater responsibility. So he was going to hold them accountable in a greater way. So we even look at Peter uh, as someone that's respected even higher than some of the other 12. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible tells us that God's no respecter of persons. God, uh, he doesn't play favoritism. But remember, we're talking about the early church, the new church. Okay, they're brand new. Any training that anybody had was the religion, the Judaism that they learned in the temple, in the synagogue. And so in that uh, religious system, there was all kinds of favoritism. You remember the Pharisees, the way they treated people, you know, kiss my ring and this kind of stuff. <laughs> right? Am I wrong or what? Anybody read their Bible lady? Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about? That's right. Come on. There was a lot of favoritism in that, in what they learned. Even the scribes, the, the Sadducees, you know, the teachers of the law, they walked around, you know, with a, a, a holier-than-thou mentality. All you have to do is watch some of those men, those leaders of the, the, the temple and synagogue, and watch them walk by a Samaritan. Anybody remember the Samaritans? Half Jew, half Gentile. Uh, according to the, the high priest, they were dirty dogs. How sad, huh? Yeah. Think about this. And when they would walk by some of these people, they would like their, their cloak and, and all, you know, their phylacteries and all the stuff that they would wear. They would like wrap it up real tight as they were walking when they go because they didn't want to touch the Samaritan. They didn't even want their clothes to touch a Samaritan. Why? Because it would make them unclean. See, what I'm talking about tonight is that in the old religion of Judaism, before Jesus came, all of the, the, the chosen people of Israel took the Bible and many of them took it the wrong way. They looked at it as rules and regulations and they turned it into religion. And this is why there was favoritism. This is why there was this disrespect and lack of love. This is why. It wasn't because God set up an unrighteous rule that, that people followed and it just came out unrighteous. No, how many of God is righteous? God is almighty. He's good all the time. And his word is good all the time. Well, folks, I said all that to say this. The early church, if they had learned anything, it was a lot of that stuff. And they were now learning something new. Something was going on. The Holy Spirit was working in the church. And I want you to hear this with me tonight, and, and you'll figure out the title from this statement. What many of the believers did not understand is that once they were saved and forgiven, God had worked on them so that they could believe 
And now he's working in them, working inside of them. Well, what is God doing when God is working inside of these brand new believers? I'll tell you what he's doing, because it's the very same thing he's doing in this house tonight. This is what, he, what God is doing. He saves the new believer, and then he begins to work in them, and he begins a, a process of breaking down walls that are inside of them. Ugly walls. What I've come to notice in Scripture, and the Scripture's like a mirror, so it kind of shines back to me, and it makes me realize where I'm at. I don't know if you, if you get that. If you look at the Word of God and it teaches you something about yourself, then you're reading the Bible the right way. If you're reading the Bible and it's teaching you something about someone else, not you, maybe you're reading it the wrong way. Every time you read it, oh, that brother needs to read this verse. <laughs> That sister, oh, I'm going to text it to her right now. <laughs> God's like, hey, just send it to them and you. Send it to yourself. What I've come to know is that uh, in my own personal life, God's word has revealed to me that I've got walls inside I didn't even know I had. And so do you. Did you know that we've got walls inside of us right now that we don't know we have? And there's some of them that are so thick and big and dividing and such an ugly hindrance that God can't just knock it down all at once because you wouldn't be able to handle it. And I wouldn't be able to handle it. So God lovingly, slowly works on us and teaches us. Tonight... I don't want to label anybody's walls because the reality is I don't I can't see your heart. You can't see mine. You might look at me and say, well, I know Pastor's issue. I know him. <laughs> Maybe you do. But how could you know if I don't even know? Right? Well, you might have a little insight, something I can't see. That's possible. But I can tell you this. There's walls in all of us. And God's tearing down. He's working on us, working in us. There's stuff that he's working on because he wants to work through us. He wants to do something tremendous through our lives. But right now, in, current, in our current status, there are some walls that are, are standing strong that the Lord, he can't work through us yet. He might be able to work in some areas. He might be able to turn a corner with you here and there. He might be able to do this. He might be able to do that. He might even be able to go a few blocks with you. But I'm telling you, each one of us, God is working in us so that he can work through us. Are you listening? Amen. You might be saying, what does that have to do with anything here? Let's get back to Peter. Because everybody's learning. And everybody should be learning in the days we live in, including leadership. I'm learning every single day how every time I look at the Word of God, the Word of God reveals to me how far I am from God. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't mean how far I am from His love. He loves me. I'm not talking about how far I am from His presence because that's not the case either. I'm talking about how He is infinitely more righteous than I am. He's infinitely more powerful and infinitely more wonderful than any of his creation. Are you listening? Amen. Amen. Are you awake? Amen. Do we have to do some jumping jacks tonight? No. Hope not. I don't want anybody leaving here without getting what we're talking about tonight, what the Word of God is revealing to us. The Bible tells us that our righteousness you already, I, I, I can already hear it in some of your minds. You finished the scripture. Huh, some of you did. Huh? Is like, who wants to say it? Our righteousness is like filthy rags. Now, I was doing the dishes today at my house. That's awesome. Isn't it? <laughs> Part of it because Sister Brenda's laid out sick right now. Oh, she, you are mean. Amen. 
No, no, as much as I can, I am. <laughs> but I discovered a pan that was covered up. Has that ever happened to you guys? Somebody cooked something and I could not recognize what they cooked. And I uncovered it and I looked and I was like, oh. Sorry, it needs to be gross. And I was like, oh. And so I started looking around for those things that really clean good. And I couldn't find anything. So I found these rags. I busted out the Ajax dish soap. It's supposed to cut through grease 99%. Right? I was looking for the Ajax and stuff you used to. You know, I was looking for it. I was going to the garage, you know, trying to find something. Because that pan needed some help. Because if I couldn't clean it, it was going to go in the trash. That's how bad that was. So I was like, but you know, I got to clean up. I mean, two now, 15 minutes. 15 minutes on one pan. <laughs> Gosh. Then I got the, you know, afterwards, I got the hot water, and I'm wringing the rag out and everything. And you know, the rag, the color of the rag was like light blue when I started. <laughs> it looked like mud brown by the time I was done. Because it looked all nasty. Right then and there, as I was looking at the rag, that scripture came to my mind. The best that I can offer God on my own, the very best worship I can give, the very best attitude, the very best offering or whatever, it is like filthy rags, like this rag. You ever smell a nasty, dirty sink rag? I didn't even want to put that thing in the washer. In the washing machine. <laughs> God revealed it to me. He made me realize that on my own, trying to offer to God, trying to get his approval, that's what it looks like. That my worship, that my offering to God, the righteousness that I would come to God with is that, like a filthy rag. But when Jesus saves us, and he washes us, and he cleanses us, now our worship is a sweet-smelling aroma to his nostrils. It is a beautiful sound to his ears. Why? Because the thing that cleanses, even the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, that it's like a, it's like a bar of soap. I don't know how to explain that tonight. I'm not going to try. But God, the precious blood of Jesus washes any stain and any iniquity and any filthy rag. He washes it perfectly. And what does he call it? White as snow. Amen. After the Lord got done with us, we're white as snow. Amen. That's righteous. Now, now we can offer righteousness. To God. Can I get an amen for any of this? I mean, think about it. You might say, you don't have to go through the whole dirty pan. Well, why not? My hands are all like prunes from that adventure. <laughs> Sometimes you and I as believers, we need to be reminded of what the Word of God says so that we can appreciate what the Word of God tells us that God did for us. When we think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not, bad as, uh, not as bad as them. You're missing it. And that's why you can't appreciate what God's done for you. You can't appreciate how, how far we were from God and how he raised us up. How he reached down and brought us out of the Miami clay. See, when we realize that, then our worship becomes genuine. Then we can sing. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Then we can say to God, Hey God, I'm sorry for what I turned it into. I just turned it into a song. I turned it into a time where I'm warming up before the preaching. I turned it into, I'm sitting out in my car waiting for the song service to get done because I don't want to go in there and sing. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I made it. Is anybody listening? Yeah. All right, I got to get to this though. Everybody's learning. And we're looking at this early church, even the leadership of it. And we're watching God in His wonderful and powerful work. We're watching Him work. 
And, and so let's look at Peter just for a few moments tonight. I know I said a few moments, but we're going to have a video. So we started out right here. Let's, let's do this. We, we, we read the whole story, so we kind of get it. Verse 43 of chapter 9 tells us that Peter was staying for a number of days, a lot of days, at Simon the Tanner's house. Okay? Why is that important? First of all, Peter was going through a time where God's working on Peter's walls. Walls that Peter didn't even know he had. We're going to label Peter's walls exactly what it is. It's called prejudice. Peter didn't even know that he was prejudiced. He didn't even know. God knew. What I love about God is God doesn't go, oh, you evil person, ugly, ugh, you're prejudiced. How dare you? God doesn't do that. God says, you got some stuff inside of you that I want to teach you how to get past. I want to teach you how to love. You know what happened to me today? I experienced prejudice today. Does anybody want to hear that story? Three of you? Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I experienced prejudice today. And it was weird. It was strange. Me and Josiah were talking about it on the way. So I went to pick up Josiah at school. And, well, well, on our way back, I had a craving for some fish taco. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> But you know what I did? I bought two and I took them home to get less bread so that, you know, it works out. You know. It's called a love offering. <laughs> and so I'm in line. Because it's a dollar a taco on Wednesday. And these things are a beast. They're good, man. I'm like, mmm, best I tasted. And the biggest for a dollar. So we're in line. It's pretty good. I'm not telling you where it's at. You get it? So, so next week I can show up in the nights twice as long? Later for that? No, I'm just <laughs> So I'm standing in line and I'm watching the line. And a couple of beautiful things happening. There's a, there's a black lady in a wheelchair and you can tell she's, she's very handicapped and struggling. And I, and I watched this, this, um, this family that was eating there how pretty her, her bag, and she couldn't use her arms, and she was like smiling and saying thank you. And then she came toward the door, and so I was like, I'm not, I got love for my sister here. So open the door, help her get, come out. She's all smiling, thank you. I'm thinking, wow, what a beautiful thing that just happened. You know, um, you know this is a, a, it's a taco place, okay? A lot of, a lot of Mexicans, Latinos that were there. And this black lady's there, and they loved on her and, and cared for her. So I'm in line and I'm while listening to the people order and they're all ordering in Spanish. You know what happened when I got there, right? <laughs> um, um, right, that's what happened to me. No, I, I didn't do it quite like that. But they're all ordering in Spanish. And I'm watching the person who's all taking their order. And she's smiling, and they're talking back and forth in Spanish, and they're joking as they're going. Right? And then I walk up and I say hi. You know, all like white boyish. <laughs> Hi. Come again? <laughs> That's my brother Matt right there. A brother from another brother, right? Is that how that goes? <laughs> you know I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I walk up with, Hi. Um, and the lady looks at me and she goes, I just exactly like I just showed you. It's on YouTube, so man, it's a goofy face and everything. She's just, she was like, like this and all that. She sees, and she hears me, starts to order, and she's like, Okay, my <laughs> Exactly. The only problem is, the only problem is, 
the couple of white people that were in there, she was smiling with them because she expected them to walk up and say hi. She looked at me, she expected me to start rolling. <laughs> I'm working on it now. I'm working on it now. I'm not going back there until you teach me how to order fish tacos. They got, I got in trouble with it. She expected that. Because the way I look, when I came out with, hi, can I want some fish tacos? You know? She goofed up my order. She oh, the whole thing, she couldn't hold it. And, and I, I walked away and I, I, I remember that I had been told this many times, many times growing up, I just never realized how real it was that, you know, people from other countries that speak Spanish look at guys like me who were born here and can't speak a little Spanish, and not everybody, but some people look down on people like me. And I got the full force of that today. I was like, wow. It's, I've never experienced prejudice against me. I've seen it in other races. I've seen it a lot. But I, didn't, I never just, I just never expected that. That prejudice. She didn't know me. She didn't know anything about me. But because I couldn't speak Spanish, but I looked like I could. I'm a coconut in her mind. I'm brown on the outside, white on the inside. I expect my the, the white customer to talk like that, but not you. And it came out in the face and the body language, and I, I was even worried about the food. I <laughs> me back out slowly, you know what I mean? I'm, I was worried. You will be surprised how much real prejudice is really in a lot of us. Different ways, not always racial. Not always racial. Sometimes it's prejudice over culture. Sometimes it's prejudice over silly things we don't understand. And we'll do the ugh face and all that stuff. And don't even realize that we're like that. And God does know it. And so he'll do things to work in us. Because I'm going to promise you this, by the word of God, if we don't get past these kinds of walls in us that divide us from the work that God wants us to get done, we'll never reach people the way God wants us to reach them. And this is what's going on in Peter. Peter was raised and he learned Judaism. He learned religious legalism. He learned all of that. Uh, you know, I was reading in Leviticus all the, the dietary laws and how, you know, be careful. Don't, you know, if you touch that, you're unclean. If you do it this way or you talk to that person in the wrong, it's unclean and you're guilty. And, and all these, these laws. And so God is working on Peter to break down that ugly prejudice because God wanted to use Peter to touch the Gentiles and to bring the gospel and the Holy Spirit to them, the message. But the way he was, it wasn't going to work. And so the first thing you see that God has Peter do is God has Peter go and stay in Simon the Tanner's house. Simon is a tanner. Uh, Brother Drew told us about that last week, uh, what a tanner was. A tanner was one who basically cut, cut up animals and got their skins and dried them out and, you know, cleaned them out. And basically they were touching a bunch of unclean carcasses. And for the Jew, the person in Judaism, that's unclean. You don't get near that. It makes you unclean. And so imagine Peter. Well, God, do you want me to go stay at Simon's house, the tenor? Okay, Lord. But all my life, that was unclean. All my life, we can do that. We can talk to those people. We can go there. Well, God's saying, well, now you've been born again. You are new in Christ. You don't see that way anymore. When you see people, you see people. 
When you see people's culture, you see people, period. Whether the culture is different or not, it's still people. And Jesus loves those people and wants to reach those people. And he wants to fill this building up with those people. And so if there's any wall in there, Peter, that you can't get past, I'm going to work on you, teach you how to love with the love of Christ so that I can work through you and you can be an instrument to reach them. Are you listening? Yeah. That's the first thing. The second thing we see, um, and, and I am overviewing this part of the story next week or so. Well, I'll have to break down some of the details that we're not going to cover tonight. But the next thing you see is that this, this man, Cornelius, he's a centurion. Verse 1 says, there was a certain man named, from Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. So uh, it tells us he's a Roman centurion. A centurion is a, is a soldier who's leading a hundred uh, hundred soldiers. He's in charge of a hundred soldiers. And he's a part of an Italian regiment that's 600 soldiers. So like there's six of him in a regiment. Okay, so this centurion, he's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. And the Bible says about this guy, look at what it says. Verse 2, he's a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour, just in case you want to know, that's 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., about the ninth hour of the day, uh, Cornelius saw a vision of an angel. Uh, an angel of God coming and saying to him, Cornelius, uh, verse 4, and when he observed it, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers, your alms have come up for a memorial before God. I don't have the time to give, give the details of what's going on there. I'll do that next time. But just understand, this man is not necessarily saved yet. Not necessarily. But he has been taught well and has done some things that have pleased the Lord and he's seeking God and you see it in his action. He's seeking, he wants to know God, he's praying to God, but he doesn't know the way yet. So a vision of an angel, the Lord comes to him and the angel speaks and says, go and get Simon Peter. Go get him. Okay? And what's interesting to me is God in the vision, in the angel of the Lord in the vision tells him, go get Peter. And by the way, Peter is hanging out at, a, at, at Simon the Tanner's house. Are you guys still following me? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. yeah. Kind of did a quick over. And I saw some of you sort of glaze over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you to sleep now. We'll pray right now. We'll pray. God help us. So the angel of the Lord says, go get Peter, and by the way, he's at the of the Tanner's house. Folks, some people would read that and say, well, God's just giving them the location. So then why does he tell them the Tanner? Why does he tell them his occupation? Why not just say, uh, uh, 14653 uh, Joppa Street? He doesn't say that. He says, the Tanner's house. There's something in that we need to see. Because Cornelius is a Gentile. Maybe he's worried when God says to him, send for Peter, the Jew. Send for Peter, Simon Peter. Maybe Cornelius gets nervous. What, is he going to judge me? Is he going to treat me bad? He's at the tanner's house. Oh, well maybe not. Because if he's there, then maybe he's loving on that guy. He's going he's to be a messenger for, for the Lord for me too. He's not going to look down on me. Are you listening? Yeah. And again, we'll get into those details later. So, the Bible tells us that the next thing you know, Peter's about to go pray, and he goes up on the roof, and he's praying, and while he's on the roof, he's praying. You ever, when you're praying, you ever get hungry? Yes. Yes. Man, yes. I do. <laughs> Problem is, I get hungry every time I pray. <laughs> and so I start to realize that it's not always hunger. Sometimes it's distraction. Sometimes it's the flesh. Sometimes it's not God. I just thought I'd throw that out there because that happens. But here's Peter. He's praying. He's on the roof. And the Bible says he gets very hungry. Now this is the one time where I'm thinking he's probably waiting for lunch or 
whatever, and he's up there praying. He's waiting for them to call and he'd come down. It's time to eat. And while he's up there, he's hungry and he's praying. The Bible says he falls into a trance. Let me just say this. We don't want to get into what a trance is right now. I'll explain it later. But I know there's some people with weird ideas about me. Peter was in a trance. What was he doing? Was he smoking a little? Or was he doing a little something where he got in a trance? You'll be surprised where Peter... Was he like doing some sort of ceremonial thing that put him into a trance where he could hear God? No. This trance... I can't explain. I've never been in a trance. I've been goofed out by a drone and stuff like that, as of some of you. But I made this kind of thing. Peter didn't cause this. The Bible says he was hungry. Think about when you're hungry. When you're hungry, can you really think about anything else but eating at that moment? No. You might be able to, but what's overtaking your thoughts is it's time to eat. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to pray right now. I can right, tell it's done. You're done. Where'd you get those two I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> I, I want to go two more weeks first, then I'll tell you. I'm going to get tired of them, then I'll tell you. <laughs> That's cool. Um, this trance, whatever it was, whatever God did, was initiated by God. God put him in it. God put him in it. Because God was going to work on some of that prejudice that was still in Peter. Maybe Peter thought, oh, I'm over that now. I'm staying at the Tanner's house. He's a Gentile, and he does stuff before a living that is ceremonial unclean, and I've overcome that. You know, people come to church, and we've been in church a while, so we start thinking we've overcome all of our, of our prejudices and our walls. Not even close. Come on, not. I'm not even getting into that. I'll just tell you this. Become more aware. Watch your actions. Watch your opinions and your views when you see things happen and the way people talk and how people hold themselves. And see if you can locate some prejudices in your life. Pastor, you know why I don't sit by that person? When that person comes this way, I go that way. I can't talk to that guy because he just annoys me. Whatever it is. You'll be surprised. Because we ignore it or we think it's normal or it's just part of regular life. Hey, you know what? Don't make a big deal out of it. Well, if those prejudices get in the way of you reaching people and being able to really do the work of God, then it's a big deal. Here we all love everybody, we love each other. But what, what, what's our conversation sound like at the house? Sitting on your, your, your couch with the TV on. And you see somebody on the TV, then they remind you of that person at your time. <laughs> you can tell I've been there, huh? What's the conversation like? Oh man, you know what? That person really gets it right. He's going to change that. Oh, but we're just going to pray for them. After you chew them up, you come here and to their face, you're like, oh, hi, God bless you. God bless you? The Bible says that out of this mouth, it, you cannot have fresh water and bitter water. Okay? You can't have both. You got to have one type of water, whatever it is. You can't be. But I think the world calls it two face. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I not supposed to go there? Is that a little too harsh? Two two face. And, and I'm not talking about the the Marvel villain two face, the coin. I'm not talking about that. Come on. I'm talking about the walls. The prejudices, the junk inside of us that sometimes we don't even realize we have. We're harsh sometimes, too. We won't let anybody in sometimes. We won't let anybody, you know, speak into our lives sometimes because we're like, oh, what can they possibly teach me? A lot of prejudice. 
limited. A lot of junk inside of us that God wants to clean up. All right, let's bring this to a close. Looking back at Peter. So here's God. I love you, Peter. But what my calling for your life is going to take some things. You're going to have to be way more open than this. And so Bible says God puts him in a trance. And in this trance, this thing like a sheep. Just imagine a big bed sheet with knots at the four corners. And it lowers down under the roof. And, and Peter's looking at it and he sees all these four-footed creatures and creeping things. Basically animals, birds, bugs, whatever. And Peter's looking at this and the voice of God says to him, Peter, rise, kill and eat. And, and Peter says this to, to God. No. God, how could you ask me that? You know, all my life, I grew up, I, didn't, I don't put that stuff in my mouth. I don't need that, so I'm clean. The Bible says that the voice came again and said, whatever I have cleansed, you, you don't call that. Matter of fact, I don't want to butcher that. So let me read it the way God said it. Verse 15, a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. What God cleanses is clean. Now, does anybody really think that God's just trying to teach Peter what he can eat? Does anybody really think that? You really think that the whole lesson of this trance and the sheep coming down with all this stuff that he would never have touched before, you really think God's just trying to broaden his menu? <laughs> is, is that what we think is going on? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that has nothing to do with it. What God's doing is he's teaching Peter something, but in a loving and powerful way. Because the first response to Peter is, no, Lord, not so. I'm not going to do that because I can't eat this. It's unclean. And God said, wait a minute. What I cleanse... You don't call it common. What, what, what I cleanse, it's clean. Then the Bible says he, he comes out of the trance. And he's thinking about it. What, is, what did that mean? What did that mean? And right when he says that, he finds <coughs> out that there are three men looking for him. Or, or some people looking for him. And God's voice comes back to him and says, go with those men and don't and, and doubt nothing. Don't doubt a single thing. What's the, what's the main thing here? Those men that came looking for Peter were Gentiles. Were people that Peter was not comfortable with because of his own prejudice. And God showed Peter his prejudice in that trance. See, there's a lot of things that God is trying to teach us how to, how to overcome or stop doing or stop looking at things that way or looking at people a certain way. Stop doubting what God's wanting to do. Stop, you know, putting limitations. And God's trying to teach us. Don't look at it that way anymore. Get rid of that. The way you used to look at it. You're no longer who you used to be. You're a different person now. You're born again. Come on. Right? Amen. But sometimes we don't even believe. We think like that. Sometimes we don't even. I bet you that person that was taking my order. I bet you if someone asked her, are you prejudiced? She would have said, who me? No, I love everybody. Uh -huh. Except for this Chicano that walked by. <laughs> Isn't that what we're called, right? Chicano? Chicano. Coconut? Is that translation? Coconut? What's a Chicano? Same thing? Mexican American. Huh? Mexican American. Mexican -American. So, a Pocho is a Mexican American that cannot speak Spanish. God. I see I'm learning. I'll bet you anything. Somebody walked up there and said, are you pregnant? She would have said no. Not at all. So is it wrong to say yes? I, I think so. Now. And the reason I think so is because imagine, imagine if God wants you to love someone with the gospel. That person, Jesus died on the cross or shed his blood. But we won't do it because oh, I didn't even reason to talk to those people. So why should I talk to them now? Well, maybe because they're not on their way to hell and God wants to forgive them and wash them clean and you're his messenger. Come on. And God wants to work through you. But the problem is he can't work through you because you still
still got to put walls up. Amen. Thanks, Jack. Thank you for asking that question because it helps me communicate what's, what the Word of God is being said. Do you understand it? Do we understand what's going on? So here's the thing. He, God works on Peter. He shows him stuff. Peter calls it unclean. And God says, when I cleanse something, it's not dirty. It's clean. In other words, Peter, you must accept what I bring to you. You must accept my way above your old way. That's heavy, huh? We're, we're done for tonight. <laughs> I'm going, you know what road I'm taking? I'm taking a long road home. I'm going to fish taco place afterwards. No, I'm not. I'm <laughs> and I'm not telling you guys till next week or so when I've had my fill. I don't want 50 people in line in front of me. <laughs> It's an amazing thing what God is doing. The big picture of it is this, though. It's not like God's nitpicking everybody individually. The Lord looks at humanity with love, wanting to redeem them, wanting to save them, make them disciples, bring them into the kingdom of God. The Lord wants to reach them. And he looks at us and says, you're my chosen. I saved you. You're already born again. I want to use you. I want to save I want to teach people my ways through you. But there's some things inside of you I see that you don't know you have. So I'm going to bring about a trance. I'm going to bring about a circumstance. I'm going to bring about a situation that's going to make you confront those issues. And you're going to learn how not to be that way. So I can use you. So I can count on you to show that love of God. Instead of walking around with that chip. Walking around with that weird wall. So the title of this evening was God's tearing down our walls, whether we know it or not. He's working on us and in us so he can work through us. The question is tonight, and I close with the question, see that I'm closing the line. How many of you are willing to let God do this kind of work and break down some of those things? Some areas where you're up to comfort. I don't know if I want God to to kind of work on that in me. I don't know if I want that. Gosh, I said that was the last thing I was going to say. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> because when God showed Peter the trance and he said, kill and eat, Peter told God, no. Maybe you're still telling God no about stuff. God's saying, I want to do this in you. I want to change that. I want you to give that up. I want you to work on that. You're still telling God no. You're saying, no, God, I'm used to that. I got used to it. I live this way. This is my way of living. God's saying, yeah, but it's not my way. And if you'll just embrace my way, you're going to find out that it's way better than your way. But maybe some of us, maybe all of us, in some area of our life or another, we're still saying no. And so God lovingly is teaching us through our circumstances how to embrace His way, how to share His love, how to open up and say, God, your way, have your way in me. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise to you.